Yeah. I think we're going live. I think we are live, Paul. One second, let me check in the group to see if we're up. We are, mate. Do like this. Yeah, here we are. So we are live. So hello, everybody. So today I am super excited to have Paul Tinker, the main man in the refurbishment space, to join us with a masterclass. Paul is somebody I admire. Not only somebody I admire, he's my coach. I've jumped onto his online training, first of all. He, pre, he more than pre-qualified himself to be worthy of that role. And then I'm going to go on to his boots on the grand uh, training day later on this year, whenever I can fit that into my calendar. Although I've done, got so much value, well, I'm still going through it because there's so much content and value on his online one. So guys, definitely check this man, man out if you're doing refurbs or involved with refurbs. I'm not heavily involved on that side of it, but I still want the understanding of that. And it's very, very important. And, and Paul guided me on just some simple things that you don't know what you don't know, you know? So... Super excited about this for my own purpose. I've got my notepad and my pencil to take plenty of notes today. Paul's going to be sharing with us a quick little masterclass around refurbishments and all things refurbishment. So, Paul, I'm going to pass it over to you to just quickly introduce yourself and I'll, yeah, I'll let you take the lead on this, mate. Thank you, mate. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, so, if, if you are uh, watching live, welcome. And um, hope you've had a great Sunday so far and whole weekend, actually, not just Sunday. Uh, so, uh, I am. I am Paul Tinker. Uh, I own a construction company that delivers refurbishment services to the property space. I've been doing this, been doing it now, direct for property investors for about three years now. Uh, my corporate background was, no, I'll go a bit back further than that actually. So I was in the military before that, uh, where I served as a bricklayer uh, in the Royal Engineers for just short of 14 years. And left that in 2007 to pursue a career in construction management a civic career in construction management. And you know what, I fell into that by accident as well. Uh, I, you know, I had no plan to do that. It was just something that I fancied doing on a whim in a five minute conversation. I was like, yeah, I'll do that. Uh, so I ended up in it. And, uh, I went through my corporate career. Uh, do I did just over 3000 refurbs uh, across the country, right from the furthest south we went was probably Exeter. And then the furthest north was Wick. Uh, so I don't think you could be any further apart uh, in terms of geography. But I worked all over, all over Scotland, all over the UK, uh, doing refurb work. So I've done it from a main contracting background and then jumped down into where I do it now. Uh, I came to form what I do now as a trainer uh, as a result of a bit of frustration working with property investors, talking away to property investors, forming my construction business and coming from the background that I came from. I had a procedural methodol methodology, is that the right word? Methodology. <laughs> methodology. <laughs> That's the one. Methodology <laughs> to delivering a project. You know, I'm great at making up words. Honestly, sometimes I finish a word and I go, is that a real word? <laughs> I, get, I, get to, I get to this, um, I start speaking to property investors and we're like, you know, have you got this? Have you got that? You know, who's doing this? Who's doing that? What, what, what's the position with CDM? And the, like, people were coming back and going, what the fuck's he on about? What's all this he's asking me for? And it became, for me, because it was bread and butter to me, it became really frustrating that every time I was speaking to a client that wanted my services, I had to show them what they needed to do as a client. And it was like, this is so taking up so much time and energy that, you know, I, I can't do it anymore. So me and the wife were in Turkey on holiday, uh, laid on a beach the one day and, and I was, you know, having the moan, as you do, uh, I'll go back to work soon, I've got to work for these idiots again. And it was like, look, Paul, why don't you teach them how to do it and form a trading business and, and teach this stuff. Uh, you know, you're really passionate about it. You're very knowledgeable about it. Uh, you know, you've got experience in it. You, you, and so just train it. You know, you're an ex-military training instructor. You like teaching, you like adding value, you like to give. So why don't you just form this training business? I was like, nah. I'm just going, come on, come on, stop, quit your whining and this is going to solve the problem that you're whining about. And it was like, right, yeah, okay. Uh, so she, she sort of pushed me into it almost. Uh, and then called me out on it, uh, booked me a hotel in the UK to do the old one day event that we used to do, turn up at the hotel and get all your shit sandwiches all day and, you know, get all the rah rah meetings and that. So we did one of them and uh, it was great. Uh, the place packed out and I was writing my element, you know, performing and showing off and, you know, old music. It was great. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. And that was the start of it. Uh, and, you know, so many people took value from that and then bought training as a result of that. Uh, the, f the first training, the training didn't even exist then. It was just like an idea in my head. So I, people bought a course that was like a 
I better go create a course now. So I created the course and it kind of snowballed from there. Uh, so you know, I've, I've kind of winged it all the way through, winged it to where I've, where I've found got it today, which is, which is great. And, that, and I love doing it. The more and more time goes by, the more and more stuff gets added to it. And, you know, the, the course used to be two days and now it's, now it's three months. So it's, you know, it's grown and grown and gone as it's, as it's, uh, as it's grown legs and, and continued. So yeah, yeah. I, I love doing it. And uh, th- that's my background and that's where we are today. Yeah, well, a couple of bits in there. I was exactly the same. My first course I'd done is the same again. It's born out of frustration. So many people was also saying, you can only invest locally. I'm like, of course, it's much more ideal. I do not advise anybody to go remote if they don't have to. But some mm. people, just, it just it's just not it's non, non-starter for them, you know, like doing it yeah. locally. So, uh, and my first course was the same. I even sold it like that. I said, look, I've not created this course. <laughs> like, if yeah. enough people stick their hand up, I'll create one. If they don't, then I just know it's probably not something that people are interested in. Yeah, yeah. But I've yeah. had in this debate yesterday. I've done a video yesterday about this, and I was on Clubhouse yesterday having this debate about coaches. Do they work? Do they not work? And it was going into me early on saying, I've pulled more than qualified himself to be a coach for me without a shadow of a doubt. Even mm-hmm. though it's an area I'm not that interested in, I know it's an area that's important for in my business. And that's the key behind it, getting the right person for you so many people judge ju- judge coaches and training all on experience i say to people look if you judge your a girlfriend what a girlfriend's like the first person you kissed quite often you'd go all your life or your boyfriend you go all your life thinking that boys or girls are no good you know like quite often you have to go yeah. around and get the right fit and the right person but that's what shines through when i done when i jumped on the online stuff with paul and the reason i'm going to go on the in-person stuff with paul as well is because you can see the passion shines through the the the, the knowledge is also there but just that passion and desire to deliver that so that's what i think makes a big difference for me when i'm seeking out coaches yeah i like, I like that analogy of the uh, of the first girlfriend i like to try, i like to try and make every analogy a sex one so that's a really good one that i'm going to steal <laughs> yeah, the, but no the uh the, I, I love the uh, i love the coach thing when, when someone approaches me for coaching and training uh the, the first question i always ask back is what do you expect as a result of working with me you know i think it's a really important thing to establish uh, i don't know if you saw a post i did yesterday somebody sent me a message because that's one of the questions that uh, we ask on our pre-qualification questionnaire when someone wants to work with us and the guy the guy responded with i want you to make me rich you know if that's if that's what you want from me it's not gonna happen mate i'm sorry yeah i'm not gonna make you rich i'm gonna show yeah. you how to manage a profitable refurb the work is on you it's not on me you've got i'll give you a path i'll give you a process a procedure and an approach for you to then go and implement. If you don't implement any of that, fuck all is going to change, mate. You know, you the, the work is on you, and that's it. Um, you know, I think I think it's a really um, really important thing to establish. You know, before if you just take on anyone that, that's not going to do do the work, they aren't going to change, and their perceived um, their perceived value of what they got from you is going to be down on the floor because that that yeah, absolutely. is so important. Yeah, we we go through it. My first one, the first people, the first course I did do, and I got them to hold their hands up. I was a little, over anal on it. I actually asked them. I said, I only want to work with people in a position to do this. So you've yeah. got to fill out a questionnaire. You've got to jump on a strategy call. But you've also with that questionnaire. I made them send me proof of funds. I made them send me uh, 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 Expedia or Clear Spring report showing that they was mortgageable. So I only want to work with people that can go. You know, like. Um, I've done a cheaper price on the first one because I I want to experiment with it, but. But even my wife said to me, that's probably a bit over the top trying to get them to send all that over. So I've narrowed it down a little bit. I still pre-qualify them. If people are uh, result, like if I ask people, why do you think you're not at where you're at? If they're blaming other people or if their only benefit is I want to be rich, these are little signs that tell you you're probably never going to satisfy them. No matter, even if they did get results, even if they did run off and do what you want to do, they're never going to be satisfied. So I'm not sure I'd be a right fit. And yeah. I've, I'm proud of it as well. I've turned down many people just wanting to give me money. Not turn them down, I'll just not close them. I'm on a yeah. strategy call. I just sort of drift it away and say, okay, yeah, you go off and have a think. And I just, and, or, I've, or I've, I've even pointed some people in the direction of other people that I think would be a better, better fit for them. And yeah. yeah, I think that's the difference. And I think that's what shines out of you as well, Paul, with, with yeah. some of the old coaches in Comparable, mate. But what I've done now, though, Paul, is I'll give you all the powers to be. We'll give you the quick little screen share uh, and... Paul is going to give us a bit of a masterclass around refurbish, managing a refurbishment whistle profitably. Stop. Give you a whistle stop essentials. That's what we'll call it. I like your title better. Yeah. Okay, essentials. We'll change that title then. 
See if we've got any. Uh, see if we've got any. Ju- see if, what did I say earlier? See if I've got any juice in my pencil. See yeah. technology. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're good. Okay, look. Share screen. So, if anybody wants to ask some questions, I'll keep an eye on my phone here to see if there's yeah, any fire questions. In the, well. uh, fire them in the chat and on the if it's been yeah. it might be in the comments in in the old Facebook. See, I've got I've got juice in my pencil now. Look, <laughs> all juiced up, ready to go. Uh, what's this? Get a new page on. Excellent. Okay, okay. Critical things, mate. Critical things for you to have. Yep. In place on a project, no matter what the size is. Doesn't matter what the size is size of the project or oh, that's going to just keep coming up don't matter what the size of the project is doesn't matter how big the house is it doesn't matter area anything these are critical for you to have on every project specification is first and foremost now these all link in together uh, but i'm going to throw the four corners up uh, first and then i'll chat through how they all overlap with each other so we got bill costs, program of works, specification, and contracts and terms. Now, why they're all so important is because if we take one of them away, the other three don't mean anything. And people don't really understand this. So if, if I take the bill cost away, you can't deliver a project to a budget. If I take the specification away, the bill cost doesn't mean anything. If I take the program of works away, the bill cost doesn't mean anything and the contract doesn't mean anything. And if I take the contract away and the terms away, no one's gonna get paid and therefore the bill cost again doesn't mean anything. So they're all critical to have in place uh, on, on every project. And I say that no matter the size, and when I talk about size, I don't mean the square meterage of the property. I mean the revenue. So those four things, it is, it is absolutely imperative to have them there before you start work. So before you start work, these four things need to be in place. Now to take your specification just to, just to start with. So your specification, what that is, is that's the nuts and bolts of what you expect to see as a result of the products and services that you've purchased. And that's with everything. Every single thing that you're going to buy, spend money on, invest in, on that project, it, has, it needs to have a specification that sits behind it. Rewire is an easy one to use as the analogy. I won't use sex here because that could get a little bit weird. So re, <laughs> rewire of a spec. A spec for a rewire, should I say. So what we need to think about is look in a room and what do you see? What do you see in that room that you want what you're going to buy? So we're going to think about the sockets. Where do you want the sockets to go? How many do you want to have? What kind of faceplate do you want to see at the end? It might be that we say, let's look at a living room, for example. We might say, I want two in that corner, one in that corner, and one in that corner for the Christmas tree. I might want uh, chrome-faced sockets, matte with USB ports in those two, but I don't need USB ports in those two. I want Wi-Fi extenders in them as well. So that would be a spec for the sockets for that room. I then need to look at the light switch. Do I want a dimmer? Do I want a rocker? Do I want two-way? Do I want uh, two rockers? Do I want a single pendant in the middle of the room? Do I, or do I want spotlights? Think about TV. Do I want the TV up on the chimney breast wall? So I may want the socket halfway up a wall. Think about the cables. Do the cables, am I happy having them trunked or do I want them behind the plaster line? Is it, is it, are we going back to brick here? Do I, or do I want them chopped in? Think about outside lights. Think about, um, think about the property itself. Is the property going to be occupied or unoccupied? Is it going to be carpets in or not? These things will affect your price. 
So when making, when we're writing this specification, these are things that we have to consider and include in the inquiry that we make. So we might ring Mr. Sparky and tell him what we want and as a result of the, the products and services that we want to install. So think about our lights, sockets, uh, CCTV, uh, what's the, the thingy, the uh, sky cables, stuff like that, so cables that you want chopping in. And then we're going to describe that per room. Your floor plan is a great place to do it. So pull out your floor plan that you may have got off your property listing when you bought it and start annotating on that floor plan where you want the sockets and switches to go. Always, always be mindful of which way the door swings. Number of times I see the door open onto the switch, pain in the ass, that you then have to go into the room, shut the door to turn the light on. So make sure that your door is going the right way when you do this. Uh, so we've got that together and then supporting information that you might send over to your electrician might well be uh, it's fully carpeted and the flooring underneath the carpet is sheet chipboard, for example, which which he's going to have to cut rather than a floorboard that he can lift. It might be occupied. The property might be occupied, might be tenanted. It might it might be your own home. And if that is, your price is going to be more because the spark has got more work to do, you know, protecting stuff, moving stuff. Uh, having to get in smaller places, things like that. And we've got to move through the property and do all that thing, all those things for Sparky. We've also then got to do that for all the other trades as well that we're going to be buying services from. Not only do we need this for trades, we need this for consultants, we need this for uh, any, any design work, uh, kitchen design, bathroom design, all this stuff needs to be specified. It needs to be specified because, it, because your build cost, which comes next, is meaningless without a specification to underpin it because the specification is what your price is based your price is based upon largely it's also a program that works but your bill cost has to be based on a spec because if it's not what we're saying is can you do me this rewire but i'm not going to tell you what i want so now what does the rewire actually mean yeah the rewire price is going to be 1800 quid and then you start them off in the property and they turn up to the property and they go uh, well, you didn't say you wanted four sockets. I've only based this on two. You didn't say you wanted chrome. I've based it on white. You didn't say you wanted spotlights. I've based it on a single pendant, for example. And that's when you build yeah, costs so, start going up. So sorry to jump in and cut you there. But I okay. think that's a, a, a really useful thing point you're putting out there because I see this comment and I've had this in before myself. I think I see one of your videos with it as well. You saying with one of your clients. I've just had it recently. Why this resonates with me? It wasn't electrics, but it was. Uh, it was down like it was pipes for the radiators coming down the wall and yeah. we just really just we just went back to brick on on something and the pipes are sitting on the outside but i didn't i didn't i can't pronounce the word i didn't spec that you know yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, <laughs> yeah but uh i didn't say it to them and i remember watching a video thinking yeah i, just, I didn't tell them that it, for me it's obvious it's like if you're going if you're replacing a room and then pipes are there it's obvious to me that just just bury them you know like but yeah, it shows you the importance of that. So who who is the owner stand on? Like, I know your answer is going to be on this, but I think it helps for people to know. Like, would you expect the? I know you're going to say to watch your stuff, and I've experienced it as I said at the end. But who would you expect the builder to or the Sparky to come to you to really make it clear? There we go. <laughs> or would it be the client coming coming to the Sparky? So yeah, hundred percent the client's responsibility. If yeah. you don't ask for it, you're not going to get it. But that's it. End of. Why? Why would you do anything different to what? What's? You know, this is one of the key things that people don't do, uh, and then blame the builder. Well, why did you put a pipe spray in the plaster? That's really obvious. Is it? Is that obvious? Yeah. I don't live in your head, mate. I don't know what's obvious. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so what's in your head needs to be on paper. If you if it's if it's important to you, specify it. It's a really simple thing to do. Um, so yeah, that spec needs to is underpins the uh, bill cost. What it does is gives you a point of reference. So it gives you that point of reference a, in the event of something going wrong, or or, or it, it gives everybody clear direction of what they're there to do. You know, and and you know what, good good builders people don't do them because they think that the builder doesn't want to see it. Good builders love a spec. It makes it easier for them to price up the work. It makes that they've then got a point of reference for the whole project. They can then issue that out to their guys, to the guys on the ground, if it's a business owner you're dealing with, for example. So ne next thing is the programmer works. Programmer works is critical because this is where all this is your time management tool, your time management document. 
Now, why is that important on a refurb is because time is money. 100% time is your biggest cost on a project. So let's say we're going to run a 30-day project. 30-day project should cover you off for a uh, two up, two down, mid-terrace refurb, for example. You should be doing them in 30 days, no problem at all. Now, within that 30 days, you're going to be incurring costs. Yeah, agreed? So we've got council yep. tax, insurance, utilities, we've got meter charges. And this is you as the client. Remember, this is the same for the builder as well. So all of these, all of these things. Uh, and the opportunity cost of, of, yeah, loss of rent. Loss of rent and, and opportunity cost, you're quite right. In that, what we mean by that is we can't refinance to get our money back out to go on to something else, right? So if you add all these up for a month, so let's say that property is empty for a month. I, I always use 600 quid for this example, to, just to make my point. So council tax might be 150, your insurance for the month might be 30, utilities 30, meter charges 30, and your opportunity, fuck me, that could be anything, eh? And then also more important than anything is your time. You as a client's time. You should be being paid from a project and not from the profit. And I think this is one of the mistakes that people make. Why would I be paid, be paid from the profit? The project should be paying me. I'm doing this for a living, yeah? If the property makes no profit, are we saying I've done it for free? So it's important that the project pays you. So let's yeah, say we're, we're on a really base 100 quid a day, something nice and cheap. So over the month, we're 3K, yeah? Yeah, I, I love that as well. So many people I see project manage prop deals themselves, and they say, oh, I've got this refurb in at 10K or 30K. And I'm like, you micromanage project managed it. You've got to account for your time. Your time is worth something like, heck, like, uh, yeah, it's beyond me. It blows my mind when people say that, you know, but there's a time cost to that. Yeah. So what we've got there is three and a half. There's about 4K there. That's solely in time. So in these 30 days here, we're going to be paying builders, tradesmen, whoever, whatever that refurb cost is. So if the refurb cost itself, let's say it's 20 grand, just for the purposes of this, you've got to add on your four. For your running costs which is, this is the number that people don't like to report this is the number that when you see the the facebook posts of fucking taps that they don't like to report they always seem to ignore that fact but it's still a cost you've got to account for this cost to know whether you're running a profitable refurb or not now look what happens if what i see so many people do property takes three months Now look at the refurb cost. It's now 32K. Solely in time. The builder's cost didn't change. The money you spent here didn't change, but this did. Yeah, and that's your biggest asset. Time, what I think oh, people don't under, underestimate. You can get money back, you can never get time back. It's your number one most valuable thing. I just read 50 Cent's book and he said, look, I bought the most opulent house in America for Mike Tyson. This house cost him 70 grand a month just on air conditioning and like maintenance to maintain. Uh, he said, I bought all, enough Ferraris and Rolls Royces to fit up a, a, a car front. Uh, yeah. He said, but the most expensive thing I've ever spent is my time. Yeah. And, and look what happens yeah. now. If your project takes a year, and trust me, this is not as rare as you think. I see this all the time. Once, well, well over on time, yeah. So it's not as well. Definitely, yeah. I can, I can hold testament to that. So, so that's what happens then. It means that your twenty-eight, your twenty grand refurb cost you sixty-eight k if it took you a year. That's what it truly cost you. You know, and people don't appreciate that. Nor did they, re did they report this. They go, oh, it cost me twenty k, but it took me a year to do, mate. You're full of shit. It did not cost you 20k to do if it took you a year. Not happening. Because this, people don't see this. They don't see these as costs because it's not going out of the bank. It's just that it's not coming in. Yeah. Yeah. So it is a loss that must be recognized in, in people's numbers because if they do recognize it, what they will value on project number two is someone that can do it quickly, which is what going to a one-stop shop construction business like what mine does what that gives you because one of the things that we do say is our prices whilst be more expensive will base them on 30 days 
Um, that 30 day cost, let's say it was a 20K spend if you was gonna manage it yourself, let's say that that, that was gonna be 30K, but it means that you've only lost four there, removed a load of risk, and it means that your bill cost is 34. And your, your spend is only ever gonna be 34 and it'll be done in 30 days and you can start bringing in income. And, and reduce it to go again. Yeah. Not just reduce the what's the name. I've I've had one shop guys and self manage and we, we always we always float between between the two, depending on what we've got on or depending on who we've got around, uh uh what builders we've got around. I usually go for a common cycle with builders though, is I usually a jump on board with me, they can't do enough for me, the prices are where we expect them to be. The yeah. common thing I find with them is they take on too much. They, they don't know their capacity. They take on too much and then the standards go down because they're good. And obviously working with me, not to say I'm um, anything great, but I have got a presence online. People know me in the area. Working with me then exposes them to other people and then they get other jobs and then they take on too much and then the standard that goes down. And because they don't understand how to... Like they're builders so most of them have been builders they're on site they've got their team on with them but then they try and run multiple jobs and hire more people they don't know how to hire people they don't know how to manage people they don't know how to run multiple jobs when they're not on site themselves and that's what i all tend to go through most of the time with builders myself yeah 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 i mean i won't, I won't go into uh contracts and terms we were uh because you just reminded me of something there that i'd rather talk about Two biggest things that I hear investors say is this. This is the first one. My builder ran over time. My builder took too long. My builder went over schedule. Now, when I get that challenge, what do you think my first question is? Why, I guess? <laughs> where, well, where, where, was your, where was your schedule? Or... Yes, show me the program. Show me the time that he went over. So you can't say a builder went over time if time was never established in the first place. Yep. All, you're all you're saying is they, they did not meet your expectation, which is what I usually hear back when I challenge that. So send me a program then and we'll have a look at what went wrong. Program? I, I don't have a program. So what, what time period did they go over? Well, I thought it would only take four weeks. Well, wh where's the program that supports that? Where did, you get this, where did you get this four-week thing from? Well, that was my expectation. It was only a small job. Well, and it's the same as the, the pipes in the wall, isn't it? It's the same scenario, absolutely. isn't it? 100%. You know, we can't know what's in your head. And this is the other one. Builder went over budget. Did he? Did he? Or did you go over budget? You're the client. You're the one spending the money. The builder cannot go over budget. Firstly, first and foremost... What was the budget and did you communicate that with the builder? Nine times out of 10, it wasn't. So how can he go over a budget he didn't know existed? How can he go over a budget that he didn't know what it was? And the other thing with the over, over budget is, what you're actually saying is you failed to manage the costs. Saying that someone has gone over budget is a bit like going to Tesco, filling your trolley, going to Tesco, getting to the checkout and saying that the woman behind the counter made your shopping over budget. Because what you did is you spent too much. You were solely in charge of everything that you put in the fucking trolley. That was your responsibility. And you've got to the till. It didn't meet your expectation. You've paid too much. Oh, Tesco girl ripped me off. Tesco girl went over budget. No, mate, you did. You put the shit in the trolley, not her. You know, and that's, that's another, another one of my, uh, one of my things. I've, that's actually just triggered my, tomorrow morning's live I'm going to do on that. Uh, I will, I will actually mention that. What, what did I say I wasn't going to mention? Contracts and terms. Contract and terms. Yeah, I've got a question around the contracts and terms. common one that comes up all the time is how you pay the terms. What, what, how do you negotiate that with, with contractors? How do you, I think this is one that always comes, comes across to me. Yeah, it's a good question, mate. It is. It really is. And I'll tell you why it's a good question, because there's no right or wrong answer. Yeah. Because the contract and terms that you're going to agree with your builder is, um, is exactly that. It's bespoke to you and him. Uh, there is, there, I, I always say him, I should, I should not get out of that habit. It's not always him, is it? Sometimes her. Um, or what's the other phrase that we use now? Gender fluid, isn't it? Something like that. Mike. Yeah, exactly. that's it. <laughs> Let's say gender neutral. We'll say it's gender neutral. So contracts and terms. Uh, first and foremost, mate, contract is not a word I would use uh, with, 
with uh, when we're trying to get somebody new on board. The word contract will make quite a few uh, potential trades uh, run away. So I would yeah. use the word agreement instead. It's a more amiable term. It's a more um, it's a more it's a term that people are going to get more on board with. Obviously. What we're going to we sign a contract. You know, you, people are straight away going to be a bit. Oh, hey, no. contract. Yeah. It's very different to say, uh, let's get some agreements down on paper. Is that all right with you? Yeah, you see the difference? It's much more, it's softer, but it means the same thing. Because all a contract is, is, a set, is an agreement based on a set of principles, right? Uh, between two parties or two people. Uh, now, terms is, is the one. Terms is the one that usually faces the challenge. Now, terms, in if you're in the client's shoes, this is what you want. If you're in the client, I want to stretch my terms as long as possible. I want to be paying for that build as far down the road as possible. So for me, when I'm the client, this is, for me, that wants to be as stretched as far as what's reasonably practical. With your suppliers, this is a great thing. If you can get 90 days out of your suppliers, that's fab. If you can get it out of your trades, it's even better. Now, the, the further down the road that you can push your payment terms, the better when you're the client. Now, when you're the builder, it's going to be the polar opposite. The builder wants the money as soon as he can get it, of course. Now, somewhere in between those two points is going to be a place where we agree. And that place where we agree on that scale is going to be relative to appetite for risk for both of you. So, so for me, what we do in my business is we start work and we pay at the end. We get paid at the end. Because I can offer that service, my business can cash flow a service like that. And then when we get to the end, it means that the customer then has the opportunity to refinance, pull his money up from the increased value, pull the money back and then pay me. It's a great service for me to be able to offer. And it also means that um, the client sees he's got his refurb for free, although he hasn't. It, 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 that's the perception, that's the view, because the finance has paid for it and it's not money he has to raise in advance. Yeah. So that, that for me, that's the, that, the, that's the key thing. Now, there is no right or wrong here, like I say, and it's all this, this term that you agree is going to be, a, again, based around your appetite for risk. I hear people saying, I'm not paying a deposit. Well, fuck that. I am, I'm not going to work. Tradesmen aren't going to work for you without a deposit. Why would they? They need to, A, reserve time in the diary. They need to buy materials and organize stuff prior to them starting. You know, they, they, it's important to be able to do this. Now, the size of that deposit, again, is measured against your appetite for risk. If this is someone you've worked with on 20 projects that's asking you for 10K up front because they've got to buy some steel and put planning in, et cetera, et cetera, then I'd be paying it. Maybe if it was somebody new that's got no track record, no proven, no no, uh, no recommendation or anything like that, maybe I might say, you know what, mate? Tell me what I need to do. I'll pay for that in advance. I'll pay for it direct to your supplier and we'll take it from there. Then maybe on the next one, we'll do it like this. Yeah, you see what I mean? So, yeah, so we're building that relationship. There's, there, but there is no right or wrong answer here. Uh, oh, hang on, we've got locked up. What's? Oh, I've pressed too many buttons now. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need that now anyway. Um, so yeah, the, like I said, there's, there's no right or wrong when it comes to terms and contracts. As long as that contract is based around a set of principles, and that then principles are are going to be your payment terms for one. When am I getting paid? The critical thing is doing what you said you would do. So if you're, if you agree a set of terms, you've got to follow through on that. The second, the second you don't do what you said you would do when it comes to money, your build will stop. Yeah. You know, and I would do that. If somebody didn't pay me when I was due to be paid, I'd be off. See you later. I'm not, I'm not going to come back. And what's going to happen then is your project stops. You might have a fallout when this happens, but if your project stops, getting in a second builder to finish off someone else's work, nightmare. A, they want to know why it stopped. And if you're going to be honest and say, well, I didn't pay him on time, guess where he's going? He ain't going to work for you. <laughs> then he might start digging. Then he might start asking other trades that have been in the area. He might start asking in the merchants. Oh, you know that such and such down at that house down there? Who was working on that? Oh, such and such, he didn't get paid. Because when a builder don't get paid, that will start in the merchants, around the local suppliers, around their other trades. He won't be able to pay his guys, so his guys will start saying it. And before you know it, you'll never get anyone back there. 
especially if especially if you work in a small town like what we do, word word gets around really really quickly when you're a when you're a non payer of trades. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. What about the payment terms? So I like that little tip. That's what I try and negotiate if I work with somebody new. I say to them, look, let me try and just pay for all the costs up front. So the materials, you haven't got anything out of your pocket. I try not to give them a deposit. What I try to do is say, look, at the end of week one, we've on schedule, we'll pay you your wages. So you don't, you, you, they don't pay their wages to the end of the week. But some will agree with that. Some won't. Some will want a commitment from me to block the time out. So it's yeah. all dependent. Some of them you can negotiate that in. Ideally, I want to just pay for the materials and then see what their work's like over that first week and then pay them some wages at the end of that week. But some of them won't. And exactly what you said, it is definitely a negotiation both ways. But what about late payments and penalties? Do you factor them in? Would you factor them in? Is it advisable? How, how much does this make trades run off and get scared? It's going to depend on the revenue of the job, if I'm honest. You know, if it's just yeah. a little 20k refurb. Um, you're going to struggle to get, you're going to struggle to get guys on a 20k refurb when we're talking that type of contractual language. Because yeah. there's so much work out there that they don't need that Absolutely. shit. That's what yeah. you're going to get. You know, when, when, you, when you're at the higher end, when you're at the 100k plus, stuff like, stuff like that is, is going to be more, um, it's more common. People are used to working that way when they're working on revenue of, of that number and that number and above. So it's, again, this is, this is risk management now again. Uh, you know, what are, what, are your, what are the trades prepared to chuck into the pot? I mean, what, I wouldn't even start a project unless it was a repeat customer without a deposit. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even give them a date in the diary until I've got a deposit uh, because that's what, that, that's what that deposit does. It secures a slot in our year. Uh, you know, where if I didn't win any more work this year in my construction company, we're good till 2022. And that that's we've took deposits for that to be able to do that. Now, if I'd not took deposits, all of that is now at risk. Yeah, which means my whole business is at risk because if everybody pulled out, I'd have nothing for the year, then where would I be? That's why it is, that's why it's done. Um, but yeah, for one for, for, for sole traders, one man bands, you know a plasterer with a van. I don't think I'd be paying a deposit for that. Um, only if it's for materials, maybe. Uh, or if they're a bit twitchy about working with you because you knew. Uh, you know, remember this thing works both ways. You know, it's not all about it's not all about client buying a service. You know, also what you've got to consider is that does does this trade this tradesman is also taking a bit of a chance in working for you as well. You know, am I going to get paid? Yep. Am I going to get paid on time? Am I going to get paid at all? What if this guy's property refinances and he, he doesn't get the end value that he needs and he doesn't get enough money out of it to pay me? These are these are all risks for the builder as well. So, you know, yeah, it's not, it's yeah, not all one-sided and people miss that. Yeah, I'll get that. I 100% get that. Uh, the, thing, the, the, the thing with the late payment thing, I'm, I'm with you. I've never really factored that in unless somebody's really gone over and I've said... To, I've just recently said to somebody, he's a good builder, but I, I'll stake responsibility on this. I'm often guilty of this as well. If I get a, somebody who's decent, I end up loading them up too much. And I know it, I know in my head, I know, can you handle workloads? So I've just done that with a builder pre recently. I just put him on too many multiple jobs. He did say yes to a few other jobs as well, but I knew what I was going into when I went into it and the things went over. So I just held my hands up and went, I knew what I was doing. I'm, like, as you said, I'm the, I, I was on my head. I knew exactly where we was going with that. So I took full responsibility and full, 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 yeah, full responsibility for that. But uh, I don't usually factor in that late stuff. I don't think you can, no, I find it difficult with that. But uh, that said, he did run over late on a few things and took a few other jobs on in between my ones as well. And Show, I me like himself works, Harvey. Show me a program that works. Show you a program that works. Show me a program that works. Yeah, exactly that. It, it, yeah. it wasn't. It was a full program of work. Wasn't now. Yeah, for, for yeah. sure. And this so, is the, this is the whole thing about being late, right? You, you can't be late if a program doesn't exist. So this 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 would be a great thing for you to put in place. Um, you know, when you're when you're taking on multiple guys, uh, guys to run multiple projects. Sorry, give them a program. Yeah, you know, there's your program of works. Can you can you resource this and show them yeah. the overlap? You know, if you if you if you're running multiple projects and we've got, I know you don't know what I'm doing here. But a programmer works does this, yeah. And if when they overlap, he'll see that he needs t three teams. He'll see that visually, and it'll be this yeah. is when these projects need to finish. That that as it comes down. Um, 
So the, these this information, these programs and works, they are absolutely critical, critical yeah. for your builders to understand. And too many people ask the builder to do it for them. Fuck that. This is my project, my money, my pro, my portfolio depends on you delivering on time. My profit depends on you delivering on time. I'm writing the program. You need to deliver it. You need to execute it. Now, if, if the builder's writing it, guess what? He doesn't care about the end date. He's going to, if a four week project, if he can put 10 weeks on it, then he's going to put 10 weeks yeah. on it. Yeah, I'll look at more. There, uh, there was a kind of like, well, I wouldn't call it programs. I said no to that. There was like program and set time scales, like put down in writing in our agreements, but it wasn't like, it wasn't detailed into a into a program with unusually a few projects that land on we don't take on loads of projects anymore i'm just just, just just i just don't like dealing with loads and loads of builders and dealing with loads of projects i like buying property still but just not on a mass scale or like just the trade-off that comes with that it's just yeah not for me uh but uh but yeah i just i scheduled it like this on this date this is expectations we had it in writing but there wasn't a program as such to the details of how you would say. But as I said, uh, yeah, it's a common one. One of the things I, I, I was toying with is just saying to somebody, look, if you if you take on other jobs in between, I agree to jobs time and specification. So right, look, we're agreeing a time and a job which is fair, we've, we'll put it out. And you've got another job on in between that and it's running over because you've now took something else on which you've not got the capacity to take on. Uh, I was negotiating saying, look, I'm going to work out what the opportunity cost is of the rent and everything not coming in. And that just gets charged to you daily. So if you're confident you can deliver that like that and not take on other jobs, or if you do take on other jobs, you're confident that you can manage multiple teams, mm -hmm. then yeah, that just draws that line in the sand for us with that. But I've never really gone down that route too much if I'm being totally honest, but, uh, so no, put, in the chat, put in the chat there, mate. Uh, it's in the Zoom chat, not the Facebook chat. That's a, yeah. that link there. If you want to cut and paste that and put it in the comments afterwards, that's going to give you a, yeah. a free program template from our website. You can just download yeah. that and use it on your uh, use it on your projects moving forward. Critical document, mate. You need, we've got to have that in place. Yeah, I was going to ask you. So much info in your course. I was going to ask you for the download and the documents uh, where some of them are because. Uh, yeah, that's why I want to go on the day one and just get it all consumed in, a, in on my day one rather than sort of sort of coming backwards and forwards to it because I'm trying to block out of time. Just make a note of that so I don't have to get that out of there. I'm just copy and paste it. Like that, so no. Excellent. Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm going to have a quick little look through now, see if there's any questions in here. Brilliant. Thank you. We're just going to ask that example for the document. Somebody said that. Morning. Yep, no more questions. So, yeah, I think that has been an absolute fantastic masterclass, especially seeing as Paul uh, had to wing it a little bit because the communications got lost a little bit. Lucky I gave him a reminder yesterday it was on with me. But, uh, yeah, that was absolutely brilliant, Paul. Always love your energy, love your passion around this. Look forward to the dates. If you could pop in the dates of your next... Uh, your next master your webinar master classes as well in the comments popping the dates also for the up and coming sort of events you've got i think that'd be fantastic and useful for people and where do people find you paul where's the best place to uh, like find you connect with you work with you probably just on uh, on facebook on my facebook page now because i you know you get to the end you get to the five thousand friends don't you and that's it uh, yeah. so i started having to use my page my business page and i kind of I'll talk about this for the last sort of five minutes, mate, because this might help others as well. Um, yeah. I sort of was, I was really, um, not nervous, that's the wrong word. I was very opposed to switching it over to my Facebook page because you've got 5,000 friends, you've got a big audience there, right? Yeah. You go onto the page and it's like, like now I've got no audience. And like, yeah. like you and I were saying before we, before we started recording, uh, you know, you, you've just got to do the work, right? So I went on to my page and I started doing the work on my page. And through that business page, I grew, I grew uh, to 3,000 followers in three months. Uh, so that, that now is more, that's more helpful and there's no cap to that. So that, that can just keep going. But it's, it's having the being consistent and being persistent with, with the message, with the, the work and doing the work. Uh, you know, yeah. I show up twice a day on there. So 
the best place is, is my Facebook page, but you can drop us an email over to uh, info at constructiontradingacademy.com uh, and that will get that will get down to me if it's something direct. Um, and I've got a masterclass, as you said, uh, as you said, mate, at the end of, no, it's not, it's the start of April, uh, Easter Sunday, the 4th of April, I think it is, 6 o'clock, and that's at www.constructiontrainacademy.com forward slash masterclass. And I'll put the link in the comments for you, for your guys to uh, to register for that. And our one-day events are held on the last Friday of every month, if anybody wanted to attend that up in North Lincolnshire. Uh, March is full, April is full, I think, uh, so we're looking at the May now. Because uh, we only ever teach 12 people. I don't want big rooms full of hundreds and that. Nah, it's not for me. And that day consists of uh, pre-production, production, post-production. Post so what you must do before you start work, the actual work, and then what you're going to do after work. So we talk about defects, management, guarantees, stuff like that. And then we move, we go into site uh, and I'll do a, a site walk around and I'll show you all those things that we've just discussed in the classroom, physically on site. Uh, and that, that training is... Um, like I said, I think the next two are full now, uh, but the, the next one is end of May, I think it is. The 30th, is it the 28th of May? Something like that. The last Friday, anyway, that's when we're running, the last Friday of the month. Been a pleasure, that's mate. Been, it's been an absolute pleasure for me. I love your energy, Paul. As I said, always like connecting with you. Uh, so thank you very much for giving up your time on this Sunday. I'm going to put them links in in the uh, comments. And don't forget your Facebook group as well. It's a fantastic place. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That is, I don't know what the link is. Maybe it's construction. Uh, oh, I can't remember the name of it. Off the top it's of my just head. The construction Training Academy. That's what it. That's what it's called. Construction yeah. Training Academy. So yeah, join him in the construction construction training academy. <laughs> Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. Thank you very much for spending your time with us. Really, really enjoyed it. I'll, I'll be in touch anyway. As I said, I'm going to book onto one of these dates. Uh, later on, I want to jump up for the whole day and spend that day with you. Still picking my way through the tons of content and the tons of value you give on the online training version so yeah it's always a pleasure paul thank you for your time mate no worries all right mate we'll speak soon